Well, greetings, future social workers. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Case Management 535. And I wanna say that at this point, we are beginning to wind down the semester and the term. And I wanna commend you all for the amazing work that you have been doing. With that in mind, I think today's lesson is going to be particularly applicable, not only to our process as we move through the uh, general interventionist model of GEM and as we move into the final stages of wraparound related to case management, but it's also gonna be relevant to our own transition as we wind down this semester. And so today's lesson is going to focus on two topics. We're going to talk about transition. We're gonna talk about how you prepare clients or what to be aware of as you begin the transitioning phases of working your way out of a client's life because services are ending with that particular client. We're also gonna talk about a subject matter equally important to your role as a case manager throughout your career as a social worker. And we're gonna talk about attitude, um, professional communication, and avoiding burnout uh, as a social worker. And so both of these topics are appropriate when we talk about transition, when we talk about the beginning of an end to case management and services that we are providing to our clients. And so I'm excited to deliver this content to you. Um, what I'm going to do in today's content is I'm going to integrate <clears throat> um, a few uh, media uh, clips in here to help drive home and illustrate our point of our discussion. And uh, let's have a little fun with our lesson today. So like I said before, for today's lecture, what we will be doing is discussing, according to the general intervention model, okay, um, transition, that final stage of preparing our clients for the end of services, all right? And what we're going to do is, when we talk about transition, uh, we talk about transition in the general inter interventional model, um, similar to how we would address the transition role in wraparound. The two uh, names for these stages in case management are the same. Transition for wrap, transition for the gem model are both referring to the same process. So I'm going to do a light overview here because really what I want, where I want to spend the bulk of my time in today's discussion is providing you with resources and tips for being aware of how we communicate with each other as coworkers, as fellow social workers, how we should attend to our own emotional needs in avoiding burnout. And then I'm going to talk about attitude. I'm going to talk about attitude because as a social worker, it's going to be important to be in check with our attitude and how our attitude manifests in our work that we're doing. Um, because largely, I think, the success that you're gonna have in your career is largely attributed to your attitude because your attitude impacts your behavior. So we're gonna talk about that later in this lecture. But for the sake of discussion, let's go ahead and discuss transitioning with clients. The transition phase for our clients is something very exciting. It's something a little scary. It's something that can induce anxiety for some of our clients because transition means change, right? We deal with transitions in our lives on a daily basis. When we wake up in the morning, we're transitioning from sleep into our day, right? When we're driving to work, we're transitioning from our commute into our work day. When we get home from work, we're transitioning from work into our personal lives, maybe with our partner, our family, our friends, whatever the case is. And so when life transitions can come to mean successes and positive things in our life, but transitions can also stir emotions of loss, emotions of anxiety, right? We also experience transitions maybe when we lose a job. We experience transitions when a relationship ends. Maybe that's through divorce. Maybe that's even through uh, death and someone passing. And so transition at times can be difficult experiences that we have in our lives. And so what's important to understand is I pulled together a list of tips for you to consider um, when you are beginning to transition clients from the implementation phase, okay, or the intervention phase, according to the gym model of services, and you're now preparing them to close out their time in the program. So one thing to keep in mind is that transition always starts from day one. You never want to talk about services that you're delivering to a client um, that don't have an end date in mind, or you speak in generalities of services provided without ever emphasizing to the client that you are one day preparing that client or that family or that group of individuals you're serving for a day when you will no longer be in the picture. We have to make sure 
that our clients know that at some point they will be expected to transition out and we will want to have given them the tools and the self-efficacy, all right, to be successful within the settings that they're in. Um, think about the concept of what I've been doing throughout this term is preparing you for the fact that you need not be experts in case management when you leave, right? But the expectation is when you transition out of this course, you would have a foundation to apply to future courses related to case management. And so transition always starts with day one. We are talking about our exit. We are asking questions like, what would you do if I'm not here early on in your process working with your clients? Two, best practice should dictate that you should allow for about a 90 day window to adequately move a client through a transition phase. In a transition phase, you're adjusting your case management plan, all right, to address these final um, bits of loose ends that you're tying up, final resources, um, final demonstrations of safety plans, of, of, of clients being able to move through safety plans, whatever the case is, wrapping up therapy in, in the transition. And so therefore, best practice would call for about a, a 1.5 month window, 90 days, I'm sorry, three month window, I'm sorry, three month window of 90 days to prepare clients for the fact that they are transitioning. Now, I have to tell you though, I, I, I gave you a caveat that that's best practice. I have seen sometimes where that 90 day window isn't followed. And so sometimes you will be asked to transition your clients a lot more quickly than 90 days. In that case, you're gonna to have to apply as much flexibility as you can as a social worker to generate an adequate plan for transition. But it's also important to realize that if you have serious concerns with the transition of a client and that that window of time allotted to them is shorter than what you really need to adequately prepare a client for closing, then you should advocate for that in a professional way with your, uh, with your supervisor. But a general rule would be a nice 90 day window to transition clients. Um, it's important to understand that when you start discussing transition, when you start modifying your case plan and talking about a transitional plan, all right, what's important to understand is that that's going to stir up emotions within your clients. Over the 15 years of providing social work to clients, children and families particularly, um, when we start to talk about transition, it's not incur, um, uncommon that feelings described by families as abandonment, anxiety or fear will come up. It's important to understand that many of our families have faced rough transitions in their lives. Many of our clients have had relationships uh, end abruptly. They've had individuals in their life that were close go to jail. They've individuals walk out on them. They've had relationships that were very close to them suddenly burned in terms of their bridges. And so for clients, this sounds like um, a scary thing, okay? What's important to understand too with this is clients, um, especially those who you've come to trust and get to know vice versa throughout this process, have come to see you as a support net. A support net not only in terms of resources, okay, um, and services that are available to them, but as an emotional support. And so for our clients, they may think that a transition means an end to all of these things. They may be fearful of that loss of that support anchor to them. And so this is scary. So what we may see is a behavior in clients surfacing of regression in one or more of your clients. You may see things like anxiety and irritability. Many times what I've seen is families that have been stable for months in the case management process, suddenly when I say transition are calling me on weekends saying, you can't leave, we can't close services, things are still really tense, I don't know if we're ready, uh, my child started to miss school, uh, we're suddenly in need of repairs or resources. That's not the family trying to be difficult with you, with you or your client, but what they're doing is they're expressing that they have concerns and there's an underlying fear or anxiety about services ending, okay? So sometimes what you may experience are families or your clients giving you tons of reasons why the case should remain open. This could lead to a little confusion on your part, but what's important to, to do is always go back to the strategies that you set. Remember, we talked about frequency, duration, and intensity in order to monitor the progress of your clients. And if you have seen adequate progress, if your clients have met the goals of their plan, they fulfilled their need statements, they've met the requirements of the court, then now it is time to close services with our clients, okay? The question is, can we adequately prepare them for this transition and have we given them the tools that they will need in order to be successful when we're no longer in the picture, okay? 
And so one of the things you're going to want to do is address those concerns, acknowledge those fears and say, I understand that this is scary for you. I understand that you're worried. Let's talk about those worries, right? What is the worst case scenario that's playing out in your head? And how can we talk through some of these um, feelings related to transition? At that point, it's helpful to rehearse scenarios with the family. Rehearse some of the negative things that could happen, the safety plan, remember that earthquake plan that you developed, and talk about how the family has demonstrated in that time frame. Your clients have exhibited um, the ability to follow that safety plan and safely negotiate crises right, when they're in, um, when they're experiencing that crisis in their lives. So it's important to not only reflect on what can happen in the future, but the fact that your client has demonstrated an ability to manage stressful situations later in their life. This is one of those situations, and we're going to be able to manage this together because you've done it in the past. It's important to reflect on the positive things that have happened in the past. Talk about those little successes along the way. Let's say it's 12 weeks of services you're providing, or maybe it's three months, maybe it's six months. I've worked for some um, clients for up to two years, and it's important to go back and reflect on the successes that you've seen in that time. Um, what you want to do is sometimes you have the ability to actually prepare a graduation ceremony, a mini celebration, if you will, for the clients when you're ending services, okay? So that's really important to tailor it and make it personal to the client, whether that's an individual or a group that you're celebrating. And so over the years, when I have celebrated graduations with, with my children and my families that I've been working with, I've made it very personal to them. So sometimes what I've done is throughout the meetings over the two years that I've worked with a child and a family is we've taken pictures together. And then I'll take all those pictures and put them into a memory book for families to reflect on in the past. We'll talk about our favorite moments of working together. We'll talk about funny, tense moments, obstacles that we overcome, right? We talk about strengths lists, all those strengths lists that we identified in the beginning. Well, sometimes what I'll literally do is we'll type out the strengths list for our families. We'll print them out in really nice frames and the families will hang those on their walls to remember the positive things about one another when they were going through this process of our case management together. Sometimes the families will come up with their own poems, prayers, or they even put on performances, right? Where we all play a role on the team or we all do impersonations of one another. The important thing is, is that this is a time as we learn in Thessalonians to rejoice always. And so this is a time when we are asked to rejoice with our family. So yes, we want to acknowledge the anxieties and fears that could come up during the transition process, but we also don't want to forget that this transition is coming because progress has been made and we want, to, we want to celebrate those successes with the families or the clients that we are working with, okay? And finally, one of the most important steps is that we don't just say, well, that graduation party was great, I wish you all the best, peace out, and then you leave, right? What you wanna do is in a transition process, you're always talking about what resources the family will have available to them, the, the client will have available to them when you leave, okay? And so what's important to understand is that the client should leave with a book of resources. Sometimes you'll hear, you'll hear that referred to as a rainbow book. Rainbow books were books filled with resources and different color pages of possible resources that families may need. It's also important to understand that if a family lives in Moreno Valley, you're not going to provide them resources in Corona, right? Unless they're planning on moving to Corona. You want to tailor the resources to where the family is going to be or that client is going to be. That way they can access resources that are close to them. It's also an important reminder to always check any phone numbers or web pages for resources prior to handing that book over to your clients. You want to make sure that whatever number they're going to call, that that number works and there's someone on the other end, okay? And so those are some tips over the past 15 years that I've been transitioning clients from services um, that I wanted to pass along to you. What's important to understand and I'm excited for in this process is the first time that you say goodbye to a client uh, will be a memorable one for you, right? It'll be memorable for good reasons or maybe for not so good reasons. But what's important to understand is, is that part of the process of social work all right, is not only saying goodbye to our clients, but also it's a, a, a process of us letting go as well. And so at times we are going to love working with clients and we don't want to say goodbye. We are going to want to come up with reasons why their case should not close. But remember our families, our clients, whoever we're working with has a right 
for them to pursue their, their, um, their happiness, to pursue their lives without the intervention of systems whenever it's possible. And so it's our duty to say goodbye to some of our clients, even though it may hurt us in the process, okay? So that's enough with transition. And now we're gonna move along to some other topics that are important, uh, that I believe are important for you to take with you as you venture off into the next journey of the MSW program. So a couple of things I wanna discuss now is professional communication. This sounds like something obvious. Obviously we know we wanna communicate professionally with our coworkers, with our clients, with our supervisor in all of these settings. It's important to understand though as a social worker that sometimes easier said than done. I wanna talk about the notion of communication and particularly professional communication. See, over the past 15 years, one of the things that I've learned about social work is that sometimes we're really good about taking care of others, but we're not so great about taking care of ourselves. We come into this field with huge hearts, and it's because we want to serve others, but sometimes we put others' needs ahead of ours. And when we do that for an extended period of time, what we start to realize is that sometimes we can become pretty unprofessional in our communication. I think all of you have seen it. Sometimes you've run into other professionals, maybe they're not social workers or maybe they are, where you said, whoa, this person has been doing this job for a little too long. Sometimes they seem burnt out. Sometimes they seem really irritable. Sometimes they seem really short in their communication. The tough part is, is that as social workers, we make a career out of working with other people's lives. And so when we have a bad day, it's entirely possible that we can mess things up for the clients that we're serving and they can have a bad day too in a situation where they're already had a bad year or a bad childhood or a bad career, okay? So what's important to understand is we have a responsibility to engage professionally, not just for ourselves, but for the clients that we're serving. Most often than not, and I wanted to pull this, this particular video for you to watch, and then I'm gonna go into what to avoid in terms of communication as a social worker, more often than not, what I've seen as a symptom of poor communication in social workers who are burnt out is we get on the blame train. And what I mean by that is we start to look for fault and identify fault in everyone around us in all of our environment except within ourselves. And this is a hard reality as a social worker. I won't lie, I've been in these places myself before. What's important to understand is that you want to have some close colleagues next to you who are going to be able to check in on you and ask if you're okay. You also have to give your professional colleagues the ability to be able to point out to you when you start to move into an area of blame. Now, I wanna talk about blame really quick from the perspective of Dr. Brene Brown, that social worker slash researcher that I wanted to point out to you because she has a brilliant message on where blame is coming from. So I wanna talk about not only how to, to communicate professionally, I want to talk about the self-awareness that we should bring into our roles because we have to understand that when we move into blaming others in our role, that's really saying something about what's going on within ourselves. So what I'd like to do is let's watch this quick video on blame. And then we're going to come back to what we should avoid in terms of negative communication with our peers and our colleagues. Okay. Here's a first video. <sighs> How many of you are blamers? How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene. I am a blamer. <laughs> Let me just tell you this quick story. So this is a couple years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame. I'm in my house. I'm on white slacks and a pink sweater set. And I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen. It's a full cup of coffee. I drop it on the tile floor. It goes into a million pieces, splashes up all over me. And the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor, right out of my mouth is this, damn you, Steve. <laughs> Who's my husband? Because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10 because you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. And he got back like at 10.30. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had he come home when we discussed. Therefore, and so the rest of that story is I'm cleaning up. 
um, the kitchen. Steve calls, caller ID. I'm like, hey. <laughs> He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? <laughs> what's going on? Um, <laughs> so I'll tell you exactly what's going on. <laughs> I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled all, do, like dial tone. Because <laughs> he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? I'd rather it be my fault than no one's fault. Because why? Why? Because it gives us some semblance of control. But here, if you enjoy blaming, this is where you should stick your fingers in your ear and do the na-na-na-na thing because I'm getting ready to ruin it for you. Because here's what we know from the research. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. It has an inverse relationship with accountability. Accountability, by definition, is a vulnerable process. It means me calling you and saying, hey, my feelings were really hurt about this, and talking. It's not blaming. Blaming is simply a way that we discharge anger. People who blame a lot seldom have the tenacity and grit to actually hold people accountable because we expend all of our energy raging for 15 seconds and figuring out whose fault something is. And blaming is very corrosive in relationships, and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. Because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening. We're in the place where I was, making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was. Okay, I hope you found that video helpful. Brene Brown has a brilliant way of placing something that seems so overwhelming into perspective for us, right? And so what we learned from Brene Brown's video is that blaming is a process of resisting against vulnerability. It's a process of avoiding accountability. Now, as a social worker, it sounds like we were saying we enter this field with huge hearts and we're saying, well, we want to engage in self-reflection and we want to be aware of our feelings at all times. But I'm going to tell you in reality, that's more difficult than it seems. See, you're going to come into contact with clients who sometimes will irritate you, who will sometimes present as guarded. And in the process of doing that, they will blame you for everything that's happened in their lives. You're gonna come across supervisors who are under tight deadlines. The state, the county, the budget is all dependent upon all of the work that you are doing. And so at times they will be frustrated and it seems like, <clears throat> excuse me, that frustration is coming out on you. You're gonna have a great week working with families and sometimes the reality is, is something awful is going to happen. You are going to hear, you know, horrific stories of abuse and neglect. You are going to work with a client who you did everything you could to try to keep them from going back to jail. And one mistake led to their parole being violated. And so at times what happens is it's going to be difficult and painful, all right, for you. And when you're in that process, you're going to draw, bring this wall up in order to avoid being vulnerable, in order to avoid feeling that pain. And you're going to move into blaming because it gives us control. It allows us to protect ourselves from the hurt that we're feeling or the frustration we're feeling in the process of serving others. And so this is that process of blame. Now, what's important to understand is I've seen blame manifest itself in our communication as social workers. Let me give you some examples. When we start to yell, avoid blame, or become passive aggressive, all right, this is blame emer emerging from this lack of vulnerability that we're experiencing as social workers. I've also seen where sarcasm, you know, there's sarcasm to be funny. I like being sarcastic, but there's sarcasm that goes to avoid vulnerability, to avoid accountability. When sarcasm becomes toxic, all right, that can become harmful in our relationships with our coworkers, with our clients, and within our personal lives, right? Tit for tat conversations. I've seen this go on. I've seen us as professionals want to get into tit for tat conversations, not only with the individuals that we're serving, but even with our coworkers and our supervisors. Let me give you an example. The definition of tit for tat is really important to, to, um, to recognize. So when you engage in a tit for tat conversation, um, what it's talking about is the infliction. Listen to this, the infliction of an injury or insult in return for one that you have suffered. And so, you know, other synonyms for, for tit for tat conversations are retaliation, reprisal, a counterattack, or a comeback. So listen to that. When we are hurt, right, as professionals, imagine the damage we can do when we engage in a conversation like this with a client, 
right? Imagine inflicting injury on someone who has already been hurt or traumatized. And so at times when our emotions, our feelings aren't in check, we can engage in this. And even though we got into this field to do no harm, right? To heal others, it's easy for us to say some really hurtful, painful things, okay? When we engage in punitive language or we come with this punitive mindset, sometimes I've seen good social workers start to blame clients for things that are going wrong and saying, you know what? If that client had just not been so dumb, they wouldn't have ended up in jail. I've literally heard that coming from social workers, right? All of a sudden, all of our empathy, all of our understanding, all of our training and trauma has gone out the window because we are in such a painful place that we start to blame the clients for their own misfortune, okay? And finally, what we'll do is we'll engage in you statements, all right? And you statements can be very damaging because you statements are antagonistic sometimes in nature. And so you'll hear individuals, good, good folks, right? With big hearts saying, oh, you will never amount to this, this, and this in your lifetime, right? You won't ever um, be able to graduate from college. You never show up to our appointments on time, right? You had better start shaping up, otherwise I'm gonna to report to the court that you're doing, you're doing poorly, right? You always end up relapsing. Why can't you ever stay sober? And so I know some of you are saying, is that possible? Can social workers really sound like that? The burnt ones do, right? The ones that are in blaming mode do. And what's important to understand is when you see your coworker and they're in blaming mode, you wanna understand it's coming from a place where they're avoiding that vulnerability or that accountability, right? Something in their week, maybe in the process of them working with a client has hurt them and that they moved into that process. Likewise, that same process can actually apply for you. And so it's important to understand um, that you need good coworkers around you, professionals to help jog that. Oftentimes what's missing from all of this right here, all of this language when you're in this mode is empathy, right? And that's what Brene Brown brings back from her research, right? That all of this, when we move into blaming mode is dodging that feeling, that connection of feeling with others, okay? So let me move on to some professional tips then on how you can improve your communication with others. One is you wanna practice patience. I know a lot of you are gonna be eager to move into supervisor positions. You wanna be the, the head honchos and call the shots when you move into your career. Just know to, 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 to take that one step at a time, patience, right? Um, you know, the journey to where I've gotten today has taken 15 years. It doesn't feel like it. I remember stepping in and picking up my first case, working with a kiddo like it was yesterday. But it's a process, right, of putting in the time, putting in the hours, doing the hard work, meeting the deadlines, maintaining a positive attitude, even when you don't feel, feel like you can, right? And so patience is key. Develop a habit of patience within your lives and within your communication and within your style of working with others. You want to adopt a uh, question-oriented approach. Whenever you're confused, you're upset, you're doubtful, you're angry, before you start speaking a directive, what you believe is truth or something that you want to say, adopt a question-oriented approach to seek to understand. A lot of the times you can diffuse negative conversations if you can ask a question first as opposed to making a statement, okay? You want to wait till you respond when you're upset. Trust me. There are lots of times where I read an email and I'm looking at that email and I'm saying, ooh, I'm gonna let this person have it via email, right? And then I stop and I say, wait a minute, maybe I've misread the tone of the email. Maybe I didn't express myself clearly enough in that process. Maybe I'm upset and it's not an appropriate time for me to begin to respond. And so you have to be have, uh, willing to have that introspective and that pause, that filter in your mind to just not rattle off the first insult that you have. Avoid the tit for tat conversations, okay? You wanna be able to ask for focused feedback. Folks, if there's anything that has helped me throughout my career in the past 15 years is asking others for feedback on how they perceived an interaction with me. Focused feedback means that if I just finished a meeting with the family and we're wrapping up and we've, we've set our next meeting or we're getting ready to say our goodbyes, I'm gonna ask in this question. So either two questions you can pose. What feedback do you have for me? Not do you have feedback for me? Because if you ask someone, do you have feedback? The easy response is, well, no, so they don't have to share. But if you ask, what feedback do you have for me? So you're, you're alluding to the fact that there is feedback there. Can you provide it to me? Another way to ask for focused feedback is to say, mom, what feedback do you have for me about today's meeting? 
mom, how did you feel about the, uh, what feedback do you have for me about discussing safety uh, in today's meeting? And you're asking for focused feedback related to a specific example. The most you can learn sometimes um, professionally is the feedback that you receive from others watching you work, okay? Ask your supervisor where you can grow professionally. If you got passed over for a promotion, if you thought you were gonna get that job and you didn't, if you thought you were gonna transfer into that particular unit and you were passed over, sometimes the most growth that we can have is to ask your supervisor, hey, I've got a goal. I would one day like to be like you, right? Or one day I wanna, I wanna try my hand at supervision. Um, I wanna start designing policy. What do I need to work on and improve upon, right? To build my skill set in so that I can be successful in that role. That demonstrates to your supervisor, one, that you're willing to grow. It also represents that you have goals, but it also says to your supervisor that you are coachable. And oftentimes when I'm supervising other social workers, what I need to know is not that they think that they're a finished product, but they are willing to grow into the role that they envision themselves in later. And that is something that I can work with, okay? Reread your emails before you click send. Always do that, right? Sometimes you think it's a great idea as it's coming out, and then you read that email again and you say, ooh, I'm glad I didn't send that right away. So always be sure to check your emails. Never stop learning. Always continue to seek professional coaching. Let me throw this out. Professional coaching isn't cheap, okay? This is where you bring a consultant in who's developing maybe your leadership qualities or giving you some notes um, in terms of, and I don't mean notes like literal notes, but I said, meaning giving you some thoughts, some perspective on your own mindset and how you're seeing your work. Professional coaching isn't cheap, but as you start to move into executive positions and supervisor positions throughout your career, professional coaching is a godsend. And so I've had a couple of professional coaches throughout the years who I've engaged with to say, can you sharpen my leadership abilities in, let's say, car conflict resolution? Can you help me work with some of the strengths of my team and help me be more patient with some of my staff members that may be a little um, antagonistic, that may be a little burnt, right? Help me find new ways of working with these individuals. Keep me inspired as an executive in my leadership position. And so professional coaching is something that if you truly want to grow, hire someone from the outside to give you that perspective right, on what it's going to take to reach that next level of leadership. Read and implement material from John Maxwell. I'm a huge Max Maxwell fan. Later on, we're going to end with um, some material that I'm going to give you. I hope you can see that. This is the Maxwell Daily Reader by John C. Maxwell. If you have a chance, you can check this out. This was published in 2007. Um, I, I'm always reading something from John Maxwell, who is a Christian, but also what I believe is a, 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 an amazing leader who has tons of tips of wisdom to offer you um, about the future of your of your um, your careers. Okay, um, and finally, um, lead from the middle. This is a concept of social workers and just human beings in general being satisfied where you are. Sometimes you're going to say, I want to be that CEO. I want to be that CFO. I want to work at policy at the federal level. You may have that opportunity, but if you never stop and consider that you can still make a difference from the role that you're in, all right, then, then you're going to lose out on all of those gems and those positive experiences in your career. So there have been times where I have been the regional programs director. There have been times where I've sat on executive panels. And then there are times where I'm a faculty, just like everyone else. I'm not a department chair, I'm not a dean, and that's okay. I am completely happy and satisfied and excited about the work that I get to do with you all every single day. And so sometimes it's about our attitude and the fact that we can create change where we are, but we have to be happy with what John Maxwell describes as leading from the middle, okay? So here's what I wanna do. I'm gonna end, we're heading towards the end of our um, time together today, all right? And what I wanna do is uh, talk about social work and I will give some funny pieces. So as a social worker, you're gonna describe what you do and many people are gonna look at you and they're gonna have in their head what you do, all right? And you're gonna have in your head what you do and those always aren't gonna align. So let's look at this funny example of this social worker, right? What your friends think you do, what your mom thinks you do, you know, your mother Teresa, you're, the, you're God's gift to the world, right? What society thinks you do, you're, oh, you're so nice, you're a counselor and all of that kind of stuff, right? What your clients think you do, they think you're like, you know, the um, uh, fairy godmother, you're able to wave a magic wand and to just change life for the better. 
what you think you do, what you think you do is you're carrying the weight of the world, right? And then what you actually do is you're buried in paperwork all the time. So this right here um, is talking about that sometimes as a social worker, what's going to happen is you're dealing with all these competing voices in your head about whether you're making a difference. Sometimes you're going to leave meetings super excited because you felt like you made a difference. You saw something connecting your client. You were excited to go home and tell your partner about it. And the reality is your partner's going to have no clue what you did. Your partner's going to think you sat at your desk on the phone all day, or your mom's going to say, Oh, that's so great, honey. I can't wait for the next client that you meet, but they won't get the depth of what it is that you do. And you might feel deflated. There's going to be other days where you feel like literally the weight of the world is on your shoulders. If you're not careful about controlling those voices in your head, knowing when to turn up or turn, turn down the volume, it can really uh, lead to burnout or compassion fatigue is what we call it in our field. Compassion fatigue is when you are no longer able to feel for other clients or express compassion for others because you are so burnt out in your role, okay? And so I wanna give you a quick example um, from a seminar on what compassion fatigue is that helps put it into perspective. And then we're gonna finish up with attitude. Okay, so let me dive into this next short video. It's a total of, I think, four minutes. So I have in my hand a, a bottle of water and it's just a, an average bottle of water. There's nothing particularly different or unique about this bottle of water. Uh, but it is a bottle and it does contain water and I've just removed the cap. So here's my question. Why is there water on the floor? Why is there water on the floor? Any guesses? Because there was a shaking? All right, thank you for playing. Mm -hmm. Wrong. <laughs> We're gonna make this fun, aren't we? Why is there water on the floor? I took the cap off and I allowed the water to go on the floor. Wonderful answer. Wrong. Thank you for playing. Isn't this much fun? I shook a full bottle of water. And Lou, that's a great answer, but again, it's wrong. <laughs> we might think of a lot of reasons why there might be water on the floor. We could think that maybe there's water on the floor because of gravity. And as already has been said, because I took the cap off or because there's a shaking. But here's what we know that is universally true. The reason why there's now water on the floor is because there was water in the bottle. And I want you to reflect on that for just a moment as a metaphor, as an example of what we're going to be talking about today in terms of stress, body arousal, compassion fatigue. And what I'd like to suggest to all of us is that the shaking is not abnormal. It is the normal part of life and the work experience. The shaking is normal. And the reason why there is water spilling out onto the floor from the bottle has less to do with the shaking and it has much more to do with there's water in the bottle. Now, if we compare this, a bottle that's now only nearly full, as a moment ago it was completely full of water, if we compare that to this bottle where the water level is not at filled, but much lower, pointing out that the water level is here. And when this bottle of water experiences the very same shaking, there's little to no water that spills out. So in this demonstration today, we're creating an, an awareness and a context that the water level is kind of representative of the level of stress, and in some situations, toxic stress, or compassion fatigue, either in the workplace 
or even in our own personal life. And our goal today, and the goal of, that's a part of our mission for the work that we do and for the people for whom we serve, is not about getting the shaking to stop because that's not something that's within our reach. So overcoming compassion fatigue with professional resiliency is not about stopping the triggers, stopping the shaking, or somehow magically changing our work environment to be ideal. But in fact, we're overcoming compassion fatigue with our own personal, professional resiliency, which in fact lowers our stress levels, lowers our toxicity, so that we have a lower threshold and an optimum range for tolerating changes in the environment. Okay. I hope that you found that um, message useful. Sorry, wrong app there. Uh, so here's what I want to emphasize, and I'm asking that you could focus and take away from this particular message. As a social worker, I'm not going to ask you to stop feeling pain or frustration for your clients. I'm not going to stop, uh, start asking you to stop crying when something hurts your heart when working with a client. I'm not going to stop asking you to feel frustrated when you see a client do so well right? And then they revert back to some prob problematic behaviors uh, just weeks after they've made so much progress, right? I'm not going to ask you to consider making the bottle stop shaking. What I'm going to ask you to do is throughout your career in order to combat compassion fatigue and burnout is to develop positive coping mechanisms, what we talked about, professional resiliency ways of reducing the water level in your bottle, um, of, of calming of addressing the stress levels that you're going through. I can't promise you as a social worker that our job gets easier. What I can promise you is that we have to become better and make a conscious effort to become better at taking care of ourselves. Most of the time when I see social workers who are burnt out, what I discover with them is, is that their bottle's full right, that they're, they're trying to cope with the stress the best way they can, the water's spilling all over the place, but at the same time when you ask them how they cope, they said, well, I just sleep all weekends. Um, I'm not taking care of myself with my diet or exercise. I've developed some bad habits about going home and having a few drinks after I get home from work, or maybe I go out with others and have a few drinks frequently afterwards. And so what you'll see is, is that the stress coping mechanisms, that resiliency isn't built up. And as a result, things are spilling right all over the place. All right. So let me give you some quick symptoms, a list of what it looks like, all right, when a social worker is burnt out or when we're experiencing compassion fatigue. I want to give you some funny ones, right? So newly qualified social worker right here. This is you after your MSW program. This is you one year later. You might be a little burnt out, right? Here's another one. You're sitting there saying, come on, inner peace. I don't have all day. And guess what? It's 830 in the morning. That's not good. You're a little burnt out at that point, right? I like this one here. Oh, sure. Yes, I understand you're stressed because you're not sure when I'm going to have time to do your job and mine. This is sarcasm, right? We're talking about what sarcasm looks like and when it becomes toxic in the workplace. This also represents a negative attitude, right? So there's something going on there. This is the look you give a stressed out Ron Burgundy, right? When I'm completely overwhelmed, maybe you look like this, right? You might be a little burnt out. Here's another burnt out social worker right here. You do realize one day I'll snap, right? And so there's this, again, this sarcasm playing up, right? Where you're smiling on the outside, but you've got all this aggression and anger pent up on the inside, right? Here's another one. I've gotten to the point where I'm working here to pay for the prescriptions I now require to cope with working here, right? So if you find yourself paying for substances to manage your stress from the job that you continue to choose to go back to every single day, you might be a little burnt out, right? Here's one that I thought was funny. Sunday nights as a social worker, lying in bed wondering what fresh hell awaits you in the morning. If you are losing sleep over anxiety and fear of returning to work on Monday, then you're burnt out, okay? And here's another one here. The social worker I thought I'd be and the social worker I turned into. So I don't know if you found any of these particularly funny. I was laughing when I was coming up with these, but they are so true 
honestly, that folks, you're going to see these social workers that start looking like this and they end up looking like Beetlejuice over here because they have lost their compass of how to build resiliency in their professional lives. And as a result, it's spilling out everywhere else in your life. Okay. So really quick, when, when you are burnt out, new tasks can seem like burdens instead of blessings, right? You may not even have any feeling at all. Some of you may just say, whatever, you'll sometimes hear, you know, screw it, I don't even care. And that's apathy. Apathy is dangerous. Some of you may pose as irritable. You may you know, be frustrated easily. You might have a hypersensitivity to feedback, right? So someone's just offering you a little professional feedback after a meeting and you become super sensitive and defensive over it, okay? Substances are used, and I've heard these terms over the years of just to relax. I'm just looking to unwind. I just need to de-stress. It's been a tough week. But then suddenly a tough week turns into a tough Monday and a tough Wednesday and a tough Friday, and it starts to become more frequent, okay? Overwhelm becomes constant rather than an occurrence. You are constantly in a state of overwhelm. So I'm not going to promise you that social workers that you'll never be overwhelmed. But if you find that every day you wake up and you are always overwhelmed, that's a concern for compassion fatigue or burnout. Others are asking you or coworkers, you know, are asking you if you're okay. So family, friends, coworkers will say, you're all right. Is there something going on? All right. Because there's so much uh, tension that's making its way to the surface. Let's say you're short or snappy with coworkers, close friends, families, or partner, your partner. This is a sign of compassion fatigue. You start to think that everyone is dumb or no one understands what you're going through. This is a, a process of self-isolation self where you start to believe in your mind that no one can identify with what you're going, with, uh, going through. What's important to understand is that's why you need that reliable source of coworkers that you can trust and depend on because chances are they are feeling the same as you, okay? You want to, um, you take your, your work home with you. So even when maybe it's your anniversary or your birthday or significant event for your, your daughter or your son or whatever the case is, you start bringing your work home. You start to put aside what's happening in your personal life and saying, I can never set this down. As a social worker, you will have to become comfortable with the fact that you cannot be Superman and you can't be standing there like Batman on a building 24 hours a day waiting for the next crisis to hit. <clears throat> There's always going to be crisis and you will have to take care of yourself in between. Otherwise, you're going to miss all of those special moments. You're going to start to doubt whether your work matters or if you're making a difference. And folks, this is the most dangerous piece. Um, and it becomes difficult to remember or you to recall why you got into this field to begin with. So we're all human, right? At some point in your lives, you're gonna hit, in your career, you're gonna hit a point where you start to wonder if what you're doing matters or if you're making a difference. You may even forget why you specifically chose to be a social worker to begin with. Um, sometimes I've seen and I've experienced in, the, in this in my life is that usually when you are working with a, a a client that you're very close with. Something may happen to that client that's very tragic, right? Um, that already keeps you on edge. And you're feeling um, in pain and emotionally you're hurt by what happened. And something may happen also in your personal life that really rings true to what you experienced professionally and, it, and the water spills out. It becomes too much, right? So for me, that happened where a client that I worked with passed away due to suicide, right? Um, that was an extremely painful event for me because I had become very close to this client. And so he was young and he passed away at a young age. Concurrently, about two months later, I had a very dear friend of mine that I knew since high school who passed away also due to suicide. Now, that was a very difficult moment for me emotionally to deal with. And at that point, the water did spill over. And I had to quickly ask for help from other colleagues, professionals, and friends to say, you know, there's something going on. I'm starting to lose track of why I got into this field. And I'm also starting to wonder if what I'm doing really matters, right? I experienced this loss in my caseload of someone that I cared about. And then in my personal life, I saw a similar loss that caused me to doubt in that moment if I was really making a difference. And so I'll tell you that I needed to take care of myself for a few months. I needed to step away and take time to deepen my faith and work on my relationship with God. And also at the same time, take care of myself um, emotionally. And so then I was able to return back to work. What's important to understand is you need to have a support system around you to be able to ask the question, are you okay? Or even to point out 
Antonio, I think you're really upset by what was happening. I think you should take care of yourself. And so this is important to understand. These are real issues that you're going to step into when you're serving the clients that you're working with. So um, here's uh, some self tips, right? Here's, a, here's one option that I thought was funny for you in managing self-care. You could follow a bad, balanced diet. You can exercise regularly. You can use mindfulness techniques. You can try screaming into your pillow, but if none of that works, go with option five, right? Try crying while eating cake over the sink. Um, I tried all of those when I had my freak out as a social worker, and I think I liked number five the most, but I think it was the uh, most damaging for me in the long run, right? And so here are some healthy tips that you can utilize to manage burnout or um, compassion fatigue. Remember, you're not trying to ever stop the shaking. You're just trying to lower the amount of water in the bottle. Um, establish support. Uh, a support network at work and outside the office, you need to compare that, that feedback. You wanna schedule time um, with family for hobbies the same way you would to schedule an appointment or a doctor. Sometimes it's gonna be easy to say, yeah, I'll pick up that extra shift at work, but then you miss the family appointment. You wanna consider therapy or spiritual direction to gain perspective and insight and wisdom into what's going on. There is no harm in professionals also seeking out the counsel and the uh, services of other professionals. In fact, it's highly required, um, sorry, recommended in our field in order to take care of yourself. And if that's spiritual direction for me, that was spiritual direction and that helped a lot. Some of you will feel more comfortable with a therapist or a counselor, whatever the case is, you seek that wisdom and understanding and that perspective from another professional. Find an accountability partner, someone who's gonna call you out and say, uh, put down the burger, buddy, and pick up a salad, all right? I needed that, right? Exercise, pray, whatever's going to de-stress, declutter your mind. And don't be afraid of delaying emotion. I think this is the most important thing that I can express to you, right? Is don't ever stop and say, oh my gosh, I lost that client. That's painful. I got, I got to get back to work. I'm going to manage that later. I'll, I'll, I'll be sad about that later, right? Um, if there's a success with the family, there's going to be another crisis going on. What you don't want to do is delay that joy, right? And say, you know what? That's really great, but I've got this crisis going on. So I'm not going to go ahead and celebrate in this moment. Don't delay your emotions. If you put your emotions off, I guarantee they will come back to the surface later at a time when it's not opportune, um, uh, not opportunistic for you. So make sure that you allow yourself to feel as your emotions are coming up. And finally, you know, my, you know my personal recommendation would be to center, right? To stop for two minutes and just focus on the fact that God is present with you and you're gonna be okay because you're not going through that burnout or that compassion fatigue alone. Finally, and this is our last slide for the close of this lesson, is what I would like to do is focus on attitude now. I'd like to talk about what attitude means. And for this last one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about attitude. Let's look at an example of where our attitude is starting to become so-so, and then what I'm gonna do is share with you one final lesson from John Maxwell. As I said before, I'm a huge Maxwell fan, and I wanna share this with you. So let's look at this funny video on attitude, and let's see what's going on here with attitude at work. I want you to think about the last time you had a really good laugh. Same sea of blank faces I see from coast to coast. We're gonna, right, we're gonna do a little research because boy, is all about research and education. And so what we're gonna do here is on the count of three, if you're physically able, I'll ask you to stand. If not, do this from a seated position. But on the count of three, stand. And then facing me, I want you to just take a deep breath. And then I want you to put the shape of a smile on your face. For the purpose of this research, this does not have to be a real smile, okay? <laughs> I will give you one last set of instructions and then you can sit down and groan loudly and we will give you the reasons for this research. All right, count of three. One, two, three, stand. Take a deep breath. <sighs> now put the shape of a smile on your face. And I need to see teeth, I don't care if they're yours, okay? <laughs> now, last set of instructions. Turn and make eye contact with a victim to your left or right. <laughs> and now sit down groaning loudly. Ah. <laughs> this is great. This is great. All right. Two things here. One, now everybody has a tool. If you had to leave right this minute, and please don't, but if you had to leave right now, you would have a tool. The next time you go back to work and you're sitting at your desk and you think, if one more person puts one more thing on my desk, I'm gonna have to snatch them bald-headed. 
Now all you have to do is facing your entryway, doorway, or hallway, sitting or standing, just do this. Because the next person to walk in and see you looking like this, they're gonna know that now is not the time to bother you. play with your pain. You can be intentional. Doing little exercises. Here's another one that you may have known, you just forgot you knew it. Hold out your right thumb forefinger about an inch apart. Close your left eye. Now find someone's head across the room. <laughs> Bring your thumb and forefinger together and squish. <laughs> they don't even know they were hit. Oh. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. All right. So one of the things I wanted to share, I hope you found that video humorous, I thought it was, was that if you looked at this video, what the underlying message was, was talking about attitude and being aware, keeping our attitude in check of what we're experiencing. It was, it was this concept discussed in the, you know, not mentioned to you specifically in the video, but hinting at is this fake it till you make it, right? If you're not feeling positive, if you're feeling like you're having a rough day, to project how you are feeling or to project positivity um, even when you may not feel like it. Now, John Maxwell talks about this notion of attitude in a brilliant way. And I believe that John Maxwell's focus on attitude is imperative for us as social workers to take into our careers because over the past 15 years, I have seen, all right, where attitude makes the difference between our, our um, feeling of fulfillment within our work and us being able to fulfill our purpose as Christians, as social workers, as professionals, okay? So let's look at what John Maxwell says about attitude. Your attitude colors every aspect of your life. It's like the mind's paintbrush. It can paint everything in bright, vibrant colors, creating a masterpiece, or it can make everything dark and dreary. Attitude is so pervasive and important that I've come to think of attitude like this. And so John Maxwell says, <clears throat> attitude, is the vanguard of your, of your true self. Its root is inward, but its fruit is outward. It is your best friend or your worst enemy. It is more honest and consistent about, about you than your words. It is your outward look based on your past experiences. It is what draws people to you or repels them. It is never content until it is expressed. It is the librarian of your past. It is the speaker of your present. It is the prophet of your future. There is not a single part of your current life that is not affected by your attitude. And your future will definitely be influenced by the attitude you carry with you from today forward. So I really loved this particular quote from John Maxwell. This comes from the Maxwell Daily Reader, that book that I was holding up for you earlier if you're interested in uh, picking up a copy. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll try to, you know, you can, you can ask for a picture or something if you want, email me. Um, but this speaks to the notion that attitude, all right, is going to make its way out in terms of behavior at some point. And so the strategies mentioned to the video, yeah, those are funny, right? But if that's happening to us on a daily basis, it's only a matter of time before how we're really feeling floats to the surface. So what's really important to understand is that attitude is a mindset that you will have to work on continually. Attitude is something that you will have to ask yourself what your attitude is and is your behavior demonstrating that before you step into your office, your cubicle, your meeting with your client. So I'd encourage you just to consider that um, as you move into your future careers. All right, finally, thank you so much for staying with me. I'm gonna go ahead and bring up our timer and we are gonna close today's lesson out with some centering. Um, I really truly hope that uh, you found this information useful. Uh, all the content that I've been giving you for this course in particular has come directly from my experience in providing case management for an extended period of time. And so I really hope that you benefit from this material so you don't have to struggle um, as others will as I did, right? Stepping into the field uh, early in your career. So thank you all so much. Our scripture verse um, to center on today comes from Isaiah. Don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you I will uphold you with my victorious hand. 
Uh, and our scripture word, our focus word today will be refuge, refuge, okay? So let's stop and let's just spend, you know, uh, two minutes prior to stepping into your career. We talked a lot about some heavy topics today about the realness of providing case management, the realness of being social workers. So where will you take refuge, right, in your own life when you find yourself experiencing a little compassion fatigue? Where will you take refuge, refuge in your own life when you start to feel burnt out, when you start to question why you entered into this field to begin with? For me, I take refuge in the fact, like the scripture verse says, that I'm not alone, right? Don't be afraid, for I am with you. And so let's go ahead and put our hands and feet in a nice comfortable position. Let's take a nice deep breath, push out all those worries and concerns, exhale, and I'll keep track of the time. Okay, let's open our eyes, take a nice deep breath, come on back, welcome, welcome back. Thank you so much for completing the end of uh, this lecture. This is a reminder, don't be like me, don't be this guy who was burnt out saying, what's going on, I can't handle it anymore, right? Stick to your self-care. I thought this lesson might be helpful because it not only speaks to your future career as a social worker, but you can practice some of these burnout and compassion fatigue techniques now, right? So, so enjoy. Um, please check Blackboard for your assignments and your homework. Please feel free to reach out to me for any um, um, questions, any need to, to touch base, uh, just to, to talk, whatever you want to do. I'm happy to connect with you. Know that I'm praying for you. Uh, you are uh, wrapping up the end of a very busy semester and you are going to finish. You are going to finish successfully and I'm excited for, for you to complete this journey. So thank you all so much. God bless and I will talk to you soon. Thank you.